the real world, women often have to defend themselves, taking full advantage of their Second Amendment rights to do so. Today we're going to look at real-world examples of using guns for self-defense, breaking down stereotypes involving women and guns, and talk about the ways that women can become active in protecting and defending their Second Amendment rights. Because after all, the old saying goes, God made man and God made woman, but Sam Colt made them equal. <laughs> women arming themselves all around the country is the new normal. And with that, let me introduce our panel. Kimberly Corbin is a mother, sexual assault survivor, and for the last 10 years, a fierce advocate for crime victims. After years in public service with the Weld County District Attorney's Office, Kimberly is now a columnist with Town Hall Media. Her vocal support for the Second Amendment and our right to self-defense went viral last year when she questioned President Obama at CNN's Town Hall, Guns in America earning her praise among some of the nation's top politicos as the new national face and modern face of gun rights. <laughs> Ashley Lundahl was a four-sport athlete when she suffered a spinal injury as a teenager. When she moved to Wyoming with her husband, Ashley helped found the Wyoming Disabled Hunters Organization. In 2013 and 2015, she was named Miss Wheelchair USA and is the author of A Redefined Life, which was published last year. Please welcome Ashley Lundvall. <laughs> Antonia Okafor helped advocate for the passing and implementation of concealed carry on college campuses in Texas and continues to be one of the country's foremost <laughs> advocates for campus carry movement nationwide. Last summer, she starred in the NRA's Freedom Safest Place commercial, where she shared her struggle with those who don't believe a young black woman should advocate for the Second Amendment. Antonia is a graduate student and writes for the Independent Journal Review. And last but certainly not least, Christy McMains is a 26-year-old attorney who was violently attacked last year while getting into her car after leaving her law firm in Louisville, Kentucky. Christy was able to save her life by shooting her knife-wielding attacker with her concealed firearm after a terrifying struggle. <laughs> Christy was featured in a national television ad supporting the election of President Donald Trump, which was aired by or which was rated by CBS as one of the top five political ads of 2016. She now lives in Indiana, where she is a practicing health law attorney. So to kick things off, I'm really excited about this particular panel because the women sitting here are so diverse in their experience and every woman gets to their firearm in a different way. So I'd like to just quickly go through and see how people became acquainted with the firearm, firearms industry. How did you become an advocate for Second Amendment rights? So I didn't grow up around firearms like a lot of folks do. Um, actually, when I moved to Wyoming, um, got involved in hunting and helping more people with disabilities get involved in hunting. And so that's when I was introduced to firearms. But when I became a mom, that is when I became really interested in personal protection. And I think a lot of people see people with disabilities and they assume that that's a vulnerable population. And we certainly don't have to be. And so that is why I carry for my own personal protection as well as my family's. Awesome. I, as well, did not grow up around firearms, and it wasn't something that I really took seriously uh, until I became a victim of rape. Uh, a few years later, I'm thinking about, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that this doesn't happen again? And I started taking that right very seriously, training, understanding what it meant to carry concealed. Uh, and I trained myself and went to the range and made sure that I was ready to defend myself and my family. Antonio? <laughs> Yeah, well, I actually uh, grew up as a Democrat. My family, they're still Democrats and <laughs> for the most part anti-gun. Um, I'm, I'm still working on that. Uh, but I realized that uh, it didn't really matter that I, as a woman, you know, as a graduate student walking home 
um, to my, my car at night that I need a way to defend myself and I didn't want the government uh, to make that decision for me and I wanted that decision to be something I made for myself and so I purchased my um, first handgun last year. And, Congratulations, uh, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I've been an advocate for campus carry um, ever since, so yeah. So I actually did grow up around guns, um, <laughs> fun fact. Um, I have really cool parents, and so since I was a girl, I started BB shooting, and then rifles, then shotguns, and finally progressing to handguns, and my dad um, has a sixth sense and is just wonderful, but was very careful to teach me and my sister especially, and my mother, um, defensive tactics. And so as soon as I was old enough, I got my concealed carry permit, and um, I would go to the range, he'd have the gun you know, on the table laying down and go, get it up. <laughs> but um, so that's kind of how I became to it. And thank God I had a concealed carry permit because it did end up saving my life last year. We are very happy, happy that you are here with us. And actually there's a story that I'd like you to in the blue dresses. <laughs> I was laughing when we came out for our panel because I should have done a color wheel <laughs> like we do on Outnumbered because we're all wearing a similar color. But you hey, it up we'll fine. get over it's it. All right. <laughs> um, tell the story about how you decided to start regularly carrying a firearm as a result uh. of her story. Yeah, it's a very um, full circle moment for me right now because um, I had just moved to Kentucky as a young lawyer. It was my first real job out of law school from Indiana. And um, Kim spoke to President Obama on January 8th, if I think. Uh, 7th. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay. 8th is my daughter's yeah. birthday. This is well, she was birthday. close to that. <laughs> um, and I heard her speak, and I just remember, first of all, I very much disagreed with what the president said. But thinking how vulnerable I am as a single woman in a city, and I, I carried my gun. I sometimes would not switch it to the new purse. I just, you know, it wasn't something in the forefront of my mind. But after seeing Kim, um, I thought, you know what? I'm going to make sure I'm always protected. And I was attacked January 26. So, <laughs> have you some? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're forever linked. <laughs> <laughs> we met at the NRA annual meeting uh, just last year, and she came up to me right after the video played. There was serious, ugly crime that happened. On Kim's and, behalf. But. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> so yeah, that, uh, ever since then, it's just been this incredible journey, and to see that you know, the advocacy and the things that we say really do make a difference in people's lives, and I'm just lucky enough to have you here and have met you. <laughs> Now, Antonia, you have been an incredible activist on campus in the state of Texas to make sure that college students aren't put into these vulnerable situations um, that these universities put them in. Um, you know, the funny thing about universities is they, they claim that you, know, you can't protect yourself, but then they do not provide proper uh, means or resources to do the, the protecting um, that you need. So talk about kind of your advocacy. What inspired you to get involved in campus carry, and what was your biggest opposition um, in terms of the argument that was made against you? And, and one more thing, you know, how do you combat this idea that professors and lawmakers will say, we can't have a bunch of drunk college students running around with firearms on campus? Yeah, because we're always inebriated, aren't we guys? College students, you guys are inebriated right now, aren't you? Always. Ooh, that was maybe. Okay, maybe you guys, some of you guys are. Okay, never mind. Um, let me start with the first question. Yeah, the first, uh, when I realized that I, I had the option really to advocate for something as a student, which a lot of us, I, people always wonder, well, students aren't involved in politics because most of the time they're not talking about things that involve them. Um, campus carry was something that involved me as a student and I could actually make a difference in it. And so in 2015, I decided that I, was, I wasn't hearing the voice of the campus carry movement for the pro-campus carry side, particularly on college campuses. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to be that voice. I'm going to be out there, and I'm going to fight for that, because it's something that I, as a woman, um, it's important to me that I have that right to self-defense. Um, that's always something that's been on the forefront. So, you know, it, people talk about feminism. Well, how feminist, how much more feminist can you get by talking about self-defense and <laughs> advocating for that? And so I wanted other women to have that right. Um, I want other students to have that right. We're not second-class citizens, and the Second Amendment shouldn't end um, just because the learning begins. Right. So that's why. Um, and then when I come to the second question, I believe you're saying, 
what the... What was the biggest argument that was made the against biggest you? Argument. How did you overcome this argument that students are too irresponsible? They're not, you know, they're adults, but they're not really adulty or adults, as I would say. They're not adult enough to be really adulting and carrying firearms. So how did you not only combat that rhetorically, but how did you, you know, how did you win that argument? Because you had so much success in the legislature there. Yeah, well, you know, the biggest thing I would always get is that, well, how can you advocate for the Second Amendment? Um, you're black. Uh, don't you know that's racist? And I'd be like, well, yeah, I am black. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I would say that because I'm a minority, because I'm a woman and, I'm, and black and young, I want that right for other minorities, especially to protect themselves from people who are going to harm them illegally. Uh, they didn't like that answer very much. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that's what it always came back to is that the left will always bring that when they want to. They want to talk about um, racism and sexism and, unless you talk about something that they don't agree with and then you're a racist and you're a sexist even if you're a black and a woman. Yeah. So uh, I use that against them a lot and uh, we use that to make sure we pass campus carry. So I'm, I'm proud to um, bring the fact that I'm not the typical gun owner um, and to show that that's where the future is headed. Yeah, we're gonna get back to self-defense in a minute, but I wanna to talk to Ashley about her hunting experience because I grew up hunting in Arizona with my dad and my firearms journey starts shooting rifles with my father and then as I moved away from home, getting into more self-defense as a single woman, just like you guys. Um, so tell us about your organization, how you got into hunting and how you can encourage other women um, with disabilities to really go for it and get into the sport. Sure. So I didn't grow up hunting either and um, was very disconnected from where my food came from. And so when I moved to Wyoming and married a boy there, I didn't know that was kind of a prerequisite. Hey, make sure you can shoot a gun before you get out there. But um, it was really interesting to me. I would have people come up to me and they would say, hey, we're thinking about starting this nonprofit organization that connects people with disabilities in the hunting community. And I thought, sure, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be able to help, but I, don't, I, I like animals, so I don't, I don't hunt. And they were like, okay, well you eat meat? And I said, well, yeah, I eat meat. They're like, where do you think that comes from? And I'm like, oh, those animals die in retirement communities surrounded by family and friends. It's a beautiful experience, you know. <laughs> Obviously, it was incredibly disconnected from where my food came from. And so just continued to educate myself and learn more about, you know, um, people have been hunting for hundreds of years, and it's the way to get the best organic, this whole, like, Farm to table movement. Hunters have been doing that for yeah. a long time. Hunters <laughs> are late to the party. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else is late to the party. And so, um, and then I learned about the conservation efforts and to know that hunters um, are the single largest group of conservationists, conservationists in the world. And to see that women, yeah, absolutely, go hunters. We donate more money every year to conservation and to animal management and habitat management than any other group. And to see women starting to come up in that movement is amazing because it gives you a sense of self-sufficiency. Um, it's the best way to provide meat for your family. And it's just very empowering to see people get out and do things that they don't think their disability would ever allow them to do. Mm -hmm. And so I love hearing people say, I can't, because it gives me the opportunity to show them that they can. Yeah. And it's a really exciting time to be involved in that. And so I'm very proud to be a hunter and love to get people out doing it. Well, we love it too. She has camouflage wheels over here, so she's bringing some Wyoming to the DC area. We, go, we very go much really fast, they disappear. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to go back to the, the, kind of the myths that are perpetuated. So the number one, the, the fastest growing de demographic of gun owners in this country is women. Um, this idea that it's only a man's sport, that men are the only ones, with all due respect, uh, who own firearms or who use them um, as a hobby even, uh, is, is changing very rapidly. The number one reason women cite for purchasing their first firearm is for self-defense. Mm -hmm. So we hear a whole lot, especially on college campuses, but in the media, which is the turf that I play in a lot, about mansplaining to women like us and women in the audience about why they don't need a, a handgun on campus, why they don't need a handgun in their purse when they go to the mall. I want you all to kind of talk about how you feel when you're told um, by anyone on the left, but in particular liberal men, what you should and should not do with your own safety. Oh gosh, um, I think when you're talking myths, the biggest thing that I combated was that if you are pro-Second Amendment or pro-gun or pro-self-defense, then you are um, clearly just in favor of, of rapists as well. And you know, you're endangering women and that puts them at a greater risk. 
And like Antonia, um, I voted Democrat. I voted for President Obama in, in 2008 because this was two years after my attack. Be nice. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, no, I'm fine with admitting this because really this is important to understand where that mindset is at. This affects a huge, huge amount of women in this country and in the world. And when you think about how many people out there are victimized that you may never know about, this is a large demographic that the left keeps speaking to. So when we are hearing about you know, this is, if you're this thing, then you can't possibly be this. That's what I wanted to start combating and really help people understand that I'm taking my self-defense into my own hands because somebody else already took my power away and I'm going to take it back. This is one means of doing so. And it's, and it's clearly that victimhood uh, yeah. type of thinking mentality that made me look, she, she voted for Obama once in 2008. I voted for Obama twice <laughs> in 2012. I voted for Trump this time. <laughs> uh, so don't worry. Um, it's exactly that reason, because of this victimization mentality and realizing that if I want real female empowerment, if I want to uh, be able to protect myself and really have um, my future in my own hands, then yes, including a firearm is part of that equation. And other women, I think, are starting to hear that and starting to believe that because that's, that's the reality of it. Well, and just look at us. I mean, we could, <laughs> they would love to make each one of us, for different reasons, into a victim and to stick us in a victim box and say, this is why you should vote this way. And we're here to say that's, that's not actually the way that we have to think. Well, Christy, I wanted to ask you a more, a more pointed question on this yeah. topic. You are a victim of a violent crime. A man tried to kill you. The reason why you are alive is because you had your handgun on you and were able to use it after a, a pretty serious struggle that, that you had to have reconstructive surgery. Over, I did. Correct? Pretty severe, yeah. So how does, how does it make you feel is a stupid question, but <laughs> how do, what is your response when people t you know, say that, well, it never happens. You never hear about people using a handgun for self-defense, so therefore nobody needs one. Or, well, it's only a few people, and therefore um, we shouldn't be proliferating the concealed carry message. You went through it. So how does it make you feel when they talk about people like you uh, as if it's not really uh, a big issue that we should be concerned about? I think, and I have never really been exposed to this, but there is this negative stigma around women, um, women who want to arm themselves in particular. And people would come to me and say, oh, I really, I really want to carry a gun. I'm really proud of what you've done, but you know. And I didn't know, and I'm glad I didn't know, <laughs> because I would wait for the rest of the sentence, and it never came. Um, but when people would, I, the most common thing I've had is, well, you're very highly trained. Um, that's why you were able to access your gun. You're, uh, no. I mean, <laughs> I would like to think so, but no, I can tell you right now I'm not. Um, my attacker was less than an arm's length away from me. Um, and he was on top of me, and when I finally shot him, was bearing the knife down to kill me. Um, you don't have to be extremely highly trained. You just have to point and shoot at this mass in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's my reaction. And um, when people say, well, it never happens, I'm kind of just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, do, it does happen, and it happens more often, and women don't want to report this a lot of times. Sh I mean, people shamed me after my attack for, well, you were wearing heels, you know, you looked like a girl, I don't know, whatever. I mean, so there is no, we need to change that stigma. We need to let women know it's okay, it's prudent, it's legal, it's moral to carry a gun for your self-protection, and in fact, it could save your life because it saved mine. So that's a follow-up question to that. You know, there's all kinds of statistics that are put out by the mm -hmm. FBI. How do you propose that people in this room who are, are active in their own communities, active in different arenas, go out and help people who are survivors of attacks like that to make sure that that doesn't happen? How can we help them get you know, the help that they need and rather Absolutely. than going through the it doesn't really matter stage? I think we need some education. I mean, I think it's and not formal education, but I think we need to tell the stories you, can, you guys are all welcome to say, I know this girl, you know. But um, you can tell my story. I mean, this is something that actually happened to me. It happened to me less than a year and a half ago. It happened to me in January. Um, 
we need to let people know, people like Kim, people like me, people like Ashley, we carry guns and we're not scary and we're not going to use them when we get angry with you. But no, but when the time comes, um, but when the time comes, <laughs> should we need to, we're going to use it to save our lives. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's the conclusion. I think <laughs> it was my life or using my gun in self-defense. Thank God my attacker survived. I'm actually very happy about that. But um, it was my life on the line that night. So I think that's the message. Once people realize, oh, there's another side to the gun debate. Guns can save lives too. Yeah. And that's why it's so detrimental when we hear people like Shannon uh, Watts of Moms Demand Action, who continues to use a sexist talking point saying that, well, women tend to um, more than likely use a gun to, to harm themselves and in self-defense. We hear this all the time, right? Well, then, okay, then encourage them to go training, go to the gun range, and so we have more women using um, guns for self-defense because if they, if they continue this you know, type of narrative. There's really what they're trying to do is prevent women like me, prevent girls, young women on college campuses and, and other places from even picking up a gun, gun and thinking it's scary and not even wanting to go out and train. And then, then we have con this continual cycle generation of women who don't want to use a gun. Yeah. Um, that is a strategy against women and it's harming women and it's anti-feminist for one thing and it's right. anti-self-defense. Uh, self so Ashley, you were shaking your head. No, I was going to say, I think another, yes, all good, all good. <laughs> um, I think another part of why you see so many women carrying now is because of all the amazing programs that have been started by women for women to train and to educate. Um, the NRA has an amazing women's program, A Girl and a Gun, The Well-Armed Woman, um, Shoot, Shoot Like, like a girl. girl. There are so many amazing programs. And I mean, most of the people that I shoot with there in Wyoming are men, but I find that training with other women or getting a group of women together, that's so empowering mm -hmm. to be able to turn around and train someone else and teach them in a safe environment about how to safely use a firearm. And I think that's a big reason why there are more women is because of the women that are turning around and training others. Yeah, and I wanted to follow up on that with you specifically because you have participated in a number of mentorship programs for other women to get into the hunting right. uh, side of things. How can women, but also men as well, encourage and empower people who don't have the knowledge or who have been lied to about what it's like to exercise your Second Amendment rights? How can we encourage them to take that first step to get to the range and take their first shots? I think you have to ask them. I think so many people are so afraid to just walk up to someone and offer their services and say, hey, you know, I would love to be able to educate you in this way. Would you like to come out to the range and take them out there? help them make it, make it a safe environment. So they're not, I think a lot of people are so intimidated by firearms, mm -hmm. especially if you aren't used to them. Mm -hmm. And so if you can remove that fear and give them a safe environment of learning about firearms, I've seen so many people that light just comes on and not only do they start to realize how important it is to protect yourself, but they have fun doing it too. <laughs> yeah. And to see that happen is just really, really rewarding. And so that's why I'm so involved in it. Antonio, I know that you're starting a new self-defense initiative for women on college campuses. Can you tell us a little bit about that since half of our audience is from college campuses? Yeah. There's some so, people here from U of A, Bear Down. I don't know if they're in the room, but. Yeah, so it's called Empowered, um, and it's a self-defense initiative for um, especially college women, but really women who are on a college campus. So whether that you're a mother visiting your child on a college campus, or you're a graduate student, or you're a professor. You know, I have a professor that I know from North Carolina that was literally anti-campus carry until she, until someone started stalking her on her college campus. And now she's one of the biggest advocates for campus carry, and she gets it. Um, and there's a lot of women who get it. But you're not going to hear that on the, in the media. You're not going to see that on TV. And so it's called Empowered, AntoniaOquifor.com backslash Empowered if you want to um, see more information about it. But it's really creating a movement for women, college women, to know that there are other people like you, and we can train, and we can work together to make sure that if you're going to have a, a, a gun on a, a college campus, that you're trained and able to help other people as well. Mm -hmm. Kimberly? Yes. Your suggestions <laughs> for empowering other women to get oh into the gun industry? So there's plenty. Um, I think if you use your own story, it doesn't have to be tragic. It doesn't have to be something bad that has happened. But if you use your own life experiences and your own common sense, this is going to take a lot more women out to the range, out to, to learn a little bit more about it. I think the same as what Ashley was saying. 
if you remove that fear and that curiosity and replace it with education, that in and of itself is going to make a better firearms community and a better community in general. Um, that's the crux of the, the feminist movement, right? We want women to be educated and empowered and feel like they can do anything and watch them do it. And we're doing it and we're being shamed for it. I'm a mom, I demand action, but I know that that action has to come from myself. I can't rely on legislators or the general public with the good in their heart to not harm me. I wanna be ready for that and hopefully I never have to use it like Christy did. But. It's, it's just a different way of looking at things, but use your own common sense and your own story because that's the most important voice that you have. One myth that I want to uh, talk about is this idea um, that, you know, a talking point is that people who carry firearms are just looking for a fight. <laughs> They're just looking to, to shoot someone. Uh, Christy, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You didn't go into that, the work <laughs> oh, that no. day wanting to have to do what you did. No, um, my story, my attack started when I was walking out of my law firm to my car, um, a man tracked me, stalked me. Um, there's video of it. We rode an elevator together, and then just I was on this elevator, and I got just the creepiest feeling. And there was nothing threatening about my attacker. Um, there was no outward reason. He wasn't acting strange. I just didn't feel right. Um, I actually ran to my car because my first thought was, "Get out of here! You need to escape. You need to keep yourself safe." Um, so I was getting into my car when I was body tackled. I was pulling my left leg in. Um, I fought like hell. I yeah, broke. Right. Oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> I boxed before this, before my attack. <laughs> my boxing bags were in the back seat, or my boxing gloves. Um, but I broke all 10 of my nails off, bleeding from scratching, from kicking. Um, I, I kicked, I kicked my keys out of the ignition thinking he was gonna take me. I mean, I was doing all that I could and I still could not get him off of me. And so it wasn't thinking, oh, this man's here, I'm gonna make sure I have my gun. It was, oh my gosh, I'm out of options. Mm -hmm. And he, he's gonna kill me. And he, he was telling me he's kidnapping me and that's why I grabbed my gun. It wasn't because I was creeped out, no. It was because my life was in immediate danger and I had to do something about it. So switching gears, I, I want to go to you again. You agreed to do this ad for, for in support of Donald Trump during the election. Yes. It was one of the most widely play, played ads of the election. It was a highly contested election, one of the most watched uh, in recent memory. What, why did you think it was so important to talk about your experience in support of the president and his election? Yeah, it was a big decision for me to do that. Um, I was an anonymous little lawyer from the Midwest. I mean, I was very content to keep to myself, but as a lawyer, it's all about the Supreme Court for me, this election. And I knew, yeah, <laughs> and we have protected it. I knew how narrow of a margin there was saving our Second Amendment rights. Um, I think my Second Amendment rights are just as important as my First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. And I knew that President Trump would, there is potentially room for two or three more justices throughout his presidency on the Supreme Court. And so I felt a duty to myself, to, to you guys, to everyone here, to my family, to fight for that. And I think I did. And we, for the rest of my life, my Second Amendment rights are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're running out of time, unfortunately, um, but I want to talk about, in our closing remarks, you know, we are now on offense in the gun community. We have a, a, a president who is supportive of the Second Amendment. The House and the Senate are supportive of the Second Amendment. National reciprocity is something that's been uh, on Capitol Hill for a number of years now. Um, the Hearing Protection Act for um, deregulating suppressors is, is something that could move forward um, here in the next couple of years. But now that gun activists have some power to do some things, um, what would each of you like to see, whether it's in the hunting community, whether it's you know, with, with uh, federal land or regulations, uh, or in terms of national reciprocity or other initiatives that each of you think that we should um, be advocating for, and something that people in this room can go home 
and go to their local representative and encourage them to do X, Y, and Z. So start with you. You mentioned the Hearing Protection Act, and that's something I've been following for a long time and hopefully will be signed soon. And a lot of people think it's just about hearing, and obviously that's something that we want to protect. But at the same time, it takes a lot of the recoil out of the firearm, too. And I was teasing earlier, I'm on blood thinner. And so if I have a hard recoil and I mess up my shoulder, I just go in a circle all day long. <laughs> it's not good. So, I mean, a lot of people don't think about the other aspects of, you know, when you're hunting and things like that. And so that's something that I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing signed soon so that not only we can protect our hearing, but we've got that extra suppression that will be invaluable to hunters with disabilities. Kimberly? Um, I definitely think that the national reciprocity is uh, it's key because crime doesn't stop at state lines, uh, nor should my, my rights given to us by the Constitution. I think when it comes to, to self-defense, the fact that I can carry on this side of the line and not this one is not making this a safe space. And I am a huge fan of safe spaces because I create them everywhere I go when I carry concealed. Uh, I think... <laughs> I'd love to see that made available to everyone in this country, just like our founding fathers wanted. Sonia? Well, to piggyback off the safe spaces, uh, yeah, I definitely don't want to see any more gun-free zones, and that's including college campuses. Uh, we have rights, just like everybody off campus, and it's, I think it would be great to have President Trump just be an advocate for that and to stand up and help us um, because we're fighting state by state, but and there are bills out there already. But if we're not careful, uh, those those people who who claim to be Republicans, who claim to claim to be conservatives, will will make sure that they, that they don't go through. So we need the advocacy of our president and our legislators as well. Absolutely, I completely agree with everybody. And <laughs> period. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Kim and I, unfortunately, can attest to this, but um, you can become a victim of violence at anywhere, at any time. And therefore, I should be able to save my own life anywhere, anytime. Yeah. All right. And with that, I think that we will end. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you.